uh, with, with the, the articles and the books in which we publish. And uh, today we have the pleasure of discussing Invisible Colors by Gabrielle de Camaus. And I wanna give us a little bit of information about the book club before we get started and, and, and I introduce Gabrielle a little bit more. Uh, so this is a very safe space for you as readers of Leonardo Journal, Leonardo Music Journal and our book series to get to know and ask questions. Um, please be respectful, use, uh, use your own judgment and etiquette. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone, everyone is heard all the spaces feel uh, right for both the, the author and the artist who, who, who is sharing with us today and for you, the readers. We do have monitors online and uh, the, Nick Kronbach, who is our senior editor, will be overseeing um, your Facebook questions and relaying those back to me, making sure that I'm listening to those and, and, and that those questions are being heard by the presenter. We have our managing editor, Erica Ruby, who is also in the Zoom room and helping us out with the, um, oh, uh, with, with, the, with, uh, uh, with the whole entire discussion. So we're, we're very excited to, uh, to really be able to present um, these works to you um, with the Leonardo book series. We'll also share in here uh, through the Leonardo book series how you can get your copy of Invisible Colors, other books and other journals, how you can get updated about the next book club uh, and other events that Leonardo has. So we're very excited to have you as part of our discussion. So again, today we're discussing Invisible Colors by ba Gabrielle de, um, de Camos. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about her bio. Gabrielle de Camos is an associate professor and faculty of languages and cultures at Kyushu University of Fukuoka, Japan. She has taught at Goldsmiths University in London and was the recipient of the Hila Ribi International Fellowship. She's working with curators at museums in New York, Bilboa, and Venice, and then was the recipient of the Kakinki Grants and Aid for Scientific Research in Japan. She's the author of Invisible Colors, the Arts of the Atomic Age, um, published with MIT Press this year. And uh, what I'd like Gabriella to do is to share with us first a little bit about uh, the, um, this, this really critical uh, on book around artists who in in art that addresses issues around uh, atomic energy um, nuclear energy so i'm going to hand it over to gabriella to, to to share more all right thank you um well first i would like to say hello to everybody uh people i don't really know or see actually um and thank you for having me i'm very excited to be able to talk about this book um um all right so to try to summarize the book a little bit or how i came about to uh, write it um was um first i did my phd on the topic but uh, when i came to japan and i went to the uh peace museum uh, in Hiroshima and the one in nagasaki i was really uh shocked by all these artworks um, I never heard of. And uh, the representation of uh, the bombings was is so different from what I've, I've studied in, in the West. So this really pushed me to actually put everything together um, and try to really have a dialogue between Western and uh, uh, non-Western artworks because at the moment I started to research on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, then all the Cold War um, um, testing, nuclear testing and the artworks about this also uh, came out and a lot from Oceania, so the Marshall Islands, and uh, French Polynesia uh, because of the uh, French tasting as well uh, at uh, Mululoa uh, or Moruloa. Moruloa. Uh, there is um, a difference. Uh, the uh, French Polynesia called uh, the atoll 
Molulois, but the French call it Mululois. So there is a bit of a dispute. Um, so I've tried, there was uh, every day, almost every day I came across a new artwork, uh, a new field, a new area. Um, and it was uh, challenging to put all this together. Um, so I've decided to go for, uh, uh, in priority, uh, the artworks at the time and places uh, where the accident or the uh, trauma happened. Um, as much as I, as I could, sometimes it was just impossible. Um, but uh, that's what I've tried to do as a first step and then put them in dialogue with other uh, artworks from different places. Um, and then towards the end, uh, which has been the great surprise. Um, everything about uh, Marie Curie's time came up to me. And uh, it was kind of a surprise because everything was somehow under the radar. And I, I didn't, uh, although I did my PhD in Europe and, and uh, I come from France, then uh, everything about Marie Curie was completely forgotten. Um, I even realized that some of her writings were not translated uh, uh, in English. Uh, so I've tried to write about this a little bit. And the artworks, uh, which were primarily uh, literature, so um, uh, all types of literature, really the genre of the literature for everything about radium is very, very diverse. And also surprisingly, not just in France, but uh, uh, everywhere, Russia, United States, uh, United Kingdom, even Japan. So this has been quite of a surprise uh, and I tried to add it in my book as well. So really to summarize it in like one sentence, it's uh, trying to put a hundred, more than a hundred years of atomic uh, activities uh, into a book from Marie Curie times until Fukushima. And towards the end, I also included other, um, towards the end of the book, sorry, other aspects like North Korea and um, um, nuclear waste. Um, and nuclear medicine as well. All right, I don't know if it's clear enough. Yeah, no, I think I think that's, that that's a that's a really good summary of the book. Uh, I'd like to also get an understanding of it for for those of us who haven't been able to to d dive into the book or haven't read it. Um, you, there's there's some ways that you had thought about selecting some of the artists. Can you elaborate on um, on how you thought of, of your your thought process? I think um, trying to look up the name. Sorry of, of of how you how you referred to the the he um, he uh, If you want to talk about the structure of of how this was organized, but also really about about looking at this priority of uh, highlighting uh, works from, from the Hibakusha and what that is. Yes, so that was really, uh, so when I, I, I came to Japan and I, I saw this, um, all these artworks, uh, I realized there is actually a genre uh, of literature um, unique in, in Japan, which is called the Genbaku Bungaku, um, A-bomb literature. And it's an actual genre in which there are uh, bomb survivors. So Hibakusha is bomb survivor, uh, survivors, sorry, who were artists before the bomb and who witnessed the bomb. And that's what they uh, expressed after. So most of it is uh, writings like novels, uh, which are testimonials, um, novels, and uh, there's also painting and uh, photography, um, and uh, I would add also manga uh, to the, the list because there are so many uh, very interesting manga that have been produced, uh, produced uh, on the topic, and also some of it by bomb survivors. Um, and uh, so the Hibakusha, it's a very important notion 
um, and uh, I kind of um, use it in a, in a global way. And I take this from the photographer, Japanese photographer, uh, Toyosaki Hiromitsu, who uh, is part of the uh, Atomic uh, Guild of Photographers. And he uh, devoted his life to portray a nuclear disasters. Uh, so he went to the Marshall Islands. He went also to uh, uranium mining, which is a great part of the book I am very happy to talk about as well, which also is kind of invisible. And he, uh, very interestingly, also because he's Japanese, he talks about the... Uh, notion of global hibakusha. Uh, so hibakusha is really bomb survivor. He should only be uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors, but he opens it to uh, um, all traumas, uh, people who suffered from uh, nuclear traumas. Uh, so that's something I have kind of acknowledged throughout the book. And uh, it's also it was a way for me to also uh, put together all these artworks from different places um by by using this hibakusha uh, word yeah uh, that's a that's a good framework to 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 be able to to have that lens of of how you navigated which what works to bring in here because there's a there's a lot of connection between all of those works and the, the the artist's personal experiences within that so i think that's was really interesting to to read that thank you uh but by the way for for those who are watching live uh please feel free to go ahead and ask questions in the chat area uh, and can start the discussion. We have people helping monitor that and, 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 and navigate that. Uh, anything that you, you ask or comment on, I'll also relate that to Gabriela. So please feel free to, to pass that along anytime that you, 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 what you would like. So you write that the doomsday clock was recently set, reset to two minutes to midnight. Do you want to know any artistic or theoretical or literary reactions to that change? Um, so to the recent one, uh, I came across only like a design, um, an exhibition that's uh, precisely the uh, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists organized. So maybe I can share the website with you. So just a second. There. So this is an, uh, an exhibition that they did. Uh, so you can see it's 2018. And um, so the exhibition is based uh, on the uh, design of the at Doomsday Clock, uh, which was designed by Marty Langstroff. Uh, at the time, and which stayed, really stayed. Oh, sorry, I didn't share it. Oh, sorry. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, uh, it was, uh, I came across this, and uh, uh, that's pretty much the only thing I came across recently. Uh, I would say that um, um, the clock, uh, it was very interesting because it comes back in music a lot. Uh, and in, uh, as I mentioned in the book, uh, there is Iron Maiden, uh, who did uh, Two Minutes to Midnight, but it was like a long time ago. Uh, and it was very interesting for me because I, I, I uh, as a teenager, I liked Iron Maiden quite a lot, but I never realized uh, the uh, meaning of the lyrics, although I translated it, uh, which also helped me to improve my English. But <laughs> um, it was very interesting because the, uh, although it's a, um, a very, um, heavy metal or hard rock band and they kind of worship death 
uh, that's the that's the point. Um, but uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, no, like this is a big no no. And I thought that was very interesting, and also very interesting to put it in dialogue that uh, with other artworks that were done at at, at the time and also actions. Uh, protests by uh, women's uh, peace movement. And there was a lot of uh, peace um, uh, protests and petitions. Uh, and that was very interesting to put them in dialogue, I thought. Uh, and then there's also a uh, comics uh, book, like superhero comic books, uh, one of which is called uh, precisely The Doomsday Clock uh with superman uh so it's maybe more in the um popular arts i would say uh than um yeah that's pretty much what i came across uh so th those are so good examples um so th that kind of re reflects one of my second questions second parts of this question about if, uh, if there's any other current projects you're aware of that are continuing along the lines of the works that you're continuing with the book. So um, I guess I want to pair that with, with you talk a lot about a different works that are, that are in this book, but are there, do you want to highlight some of those specifically that help illustrate um, the, the, the narrative that you're, you're working through? Yeah, um, I will go chronologically maybe uh i will share the, the, one of the first is uh artwork I'm, I'm going to share is a cartoon so just give me a second all right and this cartoon is um about the radium girls so at the time of marie curie uh or, and a little bit after um, there is the, already the case of the radium girls where uh, young girls were contaminated by radium paint. So you can see here, here on this picture, uh, which was uh, illustration in a comic, uh, uh, sorry, uh, illustration uh, in, um, oh, sorry, I'm, uh, illustration in um, a newspaper uh, article about the case. I'm going to uh, stop sharing. Um, and uh, so the case of the Radium Girls is uh, really um, a case about uh, class difference and gender difference uh, in which um, some very young girls about uh, just out of high school or still in high school um, from working class uh where uh instructed that they needed a job they needed a job uh to help their families uh to uh have enough money so they uh, got enrolled in this uh, uh hired in these factories in which they had to paint uh clocks and watches with radium paints like the numbers the di the dials so they would uh, glow at night uh, and it was also very useful for uh, planes um, and military planes. And they were instructed to put the paintbrush into the paints, the radium paints, and uh, put it in their mouth to sharpen it uh, and apply the thing, apply the paints. And then uh, as a consequence, they got radium poisoning. And I was very strong. And my surprise was that, um, uh, the uh, effect of it, and, and uh, I've been researching the archives um, of the Argonne Laboratory. Uh, the laboratory actually tried to study the effect on the surviving ones. Uh, the effect was very strong, mm -hmm. very strong. Some of them died in within two years. Um, Others had like uh, necrosis of the jaw, so it would rot, literally rot. Uh, very painfully as well uh, onto the uh, body, uh, still alive. They were uh, dubbed the uh, uh, living dead by the press. And uh, some had like an arm cut, a limb cut, 
uh, leg cut, uh, and all sorts of cancers you can think of. Um, so that was, um, yeah, and uh, they've tried to sue the employers, uh, and it was a struggle. They, um, the corporate scientists, um, pointed out or, or blamed them for having syphilis and having a poor lifestyle, uh, which wasn't the case, um, and so on. So it's one of the first, and I think it's kind of um, um, emblematic, I would say. Um, then for Hiroshima, um, um, I'm going to share another one, which is very difficult to watch. Um, so I would like to warn um, before sharing it. Uh, and it's the picture of uh, Hibakusha, so bomb survivor. And it's full, uh, it's a close up. Uh, so it's uh, difficult to watch. All right. Um, so that's the type of images I came across when I was in, in uh, Hir uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the Peace Museums. And uh, this is mild. I'm going to stop because it's a very strong, um, a very strong image. Um, it's a type of picture I came across. And as I describe also in the book, there's a lot more, a lot more I came across that are uh, so hard to, and I, I wondered why we, in the West, we are barely have access to this. Uh, they weren't circulating. So it's uh, difficult, for me it was very difficult uh, to kind of excavate all this and look at these images uh, the first time and it's like decades and decades after. Um, there is another one I wish to share, but I don't know if it's, uh, it might be a bit difficult to see. Do, do you think that the first one is okay? Or can I, I go harder in the uh, difficult images or? I, um, I think we, we can do that. I do want to note there were a couple of questions that just came. Oh, okay. Um, and maybe we can come back to that. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, I just want to also post this out to the audience. You know, uh, the, the, this this discussion actually is is showing some really strong, um, provoking images. Um, and uh, and just to let you know, we, we'll we'll try to work with you and and, and tell you about if when when the, those come on and 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 off. So if you if you're not quite comfortable um, looking at those, we understand oh. that. Um, when, um, for those who are just joining us, we are, we actually uh, will have another request to, to do another um, summary of the book. And maybe you can summarize it in, uh, succinctly by, by talking about how you are uh, um, connecting the book to, to, to the framework of compounds. And um, can, you, can you give a little bit of a summary of the narrative in, in terms of how you're, how you're addressing the book in, in, in the With the compounds? Okay, uh, so the um, the compounds it came to me because having so many artworks from so different uh, times and places, uh, I had to find a way to present together and articulating them without uh, try, trying to go a little bit beyond national borders and and uh, kind of um, time frame as well. And uh, by looking at all this together, there are some kind of recurrent thing that came uh, to, uh, to me. Well, the first, uh, so I call them compounds, uh, some sort of interaction or intraaction to use Karen Barad's uh, term. Um, but um, um, the first one is art and science. Uh, it's the most obvious uh, that all these artworks uh, deal directly or indirectly with science or scientific applications. Um, then there's uh, another one, which is the East and the West. Um, and that's uh, also because when I came to Japan and I really saw that there are different ways of representing um, these uh, trauma, nuclear traumas. 
uh, and uh, but it's just a way to put them together because for me uh, there's not like a really clear cut between two parts of the world it's Im impossible even for me to define east and west and which country goes where um, uh, then uh, there is the uh, I think uh, <laughs> um, there is the um, type of art, art for art's sake and committed artworks. Uh, this is kind of a recurrent um, conversation in the arts, whether art should be completely insulated or isolated from political uh, things and it should only talk to itself. Uh, all should arts has, uh, have a uh, heart, uh, sorry, has a, uh, should have um, a political message, should be politic politically committed. Uh, and uh, this one helps me a lot in particular to uh, acknowledge all the artworks that were done in uh, Oceania, in the Marshall Islands, and uh, French Polynesia or Polynesia, and uh, that were very, especially for French Polynesia, uh, there's a lot of uh, anti-colonial uh, artworks. And I thought that this commitment, this political commitment was also kind of uh, matching with anti-war artworks and anti-nuclear artworks in the West. And that's why I put them to together uh, in, in dialogue. Um, and I think I forgot the other compound. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> this is my book, but I, somehow I, it slips my mind. The, 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 in, the interact, interaction. Yeah the, yeah, the interaction. So I use the word compound because for me it's, it refers to the molecular uh, the structure of the, of the atom and uh, usually when we think of a binary um, sometimes we kind of isolate it from other things like men, women, uh, white, non-white, etc. We, we kind of isolate them a little bit but for me the compound was a way to say that it's like a molecule sometimes it's just one um, compound and then sometimes it's kind of associated in different ways uh and um yeah that that's what helped me to put all this together uh as well uh and i call this also i use the um terminology by karen barad in uh which she uses in uh, uh meeting the universe halfway um it's a very uh strong book in which she um talks about quantum mechanics and in which she uh, she points out that in quantum mechanics when you use uh, a scientific device to observe uh, the atoms uh, interacting uh, but you use a different device and the act there is like a different phenomenon it appears differently according to the device you use. So she says we cannot just watch uh, or observe nature, we have to realize uh, and acknowledge the other part. It's not just an interaction, it's intra-action. So that was uh, very important, I think, uh, as well, to uh, not to precisely have like a, a wall, like separating East and West and, and you know, art and science. And the thing is that she says is that uh, there is an ontological inseparability, like we cannot separate all this, basically. I don't know if that's good. No, I, I think that's a good, that's a good summary. Um, thank, thank you for, for sharing how that, how that structure was set up. I think that helps anyone also kind of navigate through the book. Um, and there's, there's actually kind of two questions that, that relate to each other but are quite separate that I want to address. One is, one is from Pavel Sinkel on Facebook, and the other one um, we've uh, is is also kind of around um, the the gendered issue uh, around some of the work that uh, you're you're focusing on. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the one um, that Pavel um, is posing first, and then we can talk a little bit, and maybe you can talk about why 
so much of this artwork is um is is feminized in in, in a lot of ways like there's so many um the atom is it seems in a lot of ways very female yeah um so Pavel says, in your book's discussion of atomic testing in the Marshall Islands, you address the male gender nature of war as complicit in biopolitics. I'm curious if you could talk about ways that the atomic age this art also questions and subverts the dominant male center paradigm of technologies of war. So some artworks that are that kind of challenging this yeah I, well i i don't know challenging is 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 the right question but i think that or it's um are what are, are there artworks that are actually yeah just addressing or or illuminating um that you know, we war is war is often seen very um like a very kind of a masculine uh if you if you were to if you were to sort of um, gendered war, it would, it would seem very masculine, but if you were to gender, um, uh, atomic, the atom, right, uh, it, it, in, in the art, actually, in a lot of these things, you see it quite fit in quite of a, uh, a female figure, so I think those are really kind of a interesting, um, ideas there, I don't know if you can address either of those, um, yeah. I think actually it's a really nice question uh, also because I discussed it throughout the book. And at first I did think I would end up, it came out uh, through all the works I was looking uh, through. Uh, so to summarize the arguments, I think I do in the, um, uh, in the, the parts uh, on, uh, the Oceania and and uh, uranium mine as well, and all the science fiction movies of the Cold War, is that uh, for a lot of the narratives, um, a lot of the narratives are uh, in these movies. Uh, there is one human character, and she's the metaphor f for the atom, and so the woman uh, is the metaphor for the atom, and uh, it's it's a matter of controlling her. And uh, it's very interesting that all these kind of uh, patriarchal narratives are, are very uh, obvious in this uh, post-war uh, or Cold War films, in which is, is also kind of rehabilitate uh, the uh, military. Like the military is going to help us uh, to fight against uh, nuclear monsters. And um, I do make uh, a point uh, with Nancy Sparrow and uh, uh, her artwork, uh, which is very pivotal as well, called Sperm Bomb, uh, from I think it's the 60s or the 50s. Um, I forgot. And uh, she, uh, yes, uh, with other women, point out how um, why has a gender and this gender is male. Uh, um, and uh, so artworks that challenge this, it's very interesting actually, because I found a lot. I found a lot and uh, surprisingly, although we have a feminist movement, uh, movements uh, in the 60s or even Simone de Beauvoir is late 40s, the second sex, uh, I found some uh, during Marie Curie's time very surprisingly, by both men and women uh, writers. Um, and I believe this is the time of the suffragette as well, which is a very interesting context. So I have one here I would like to talk about. Uh, it's called The Red Star. Um, and uh, by um, Alexander Bogdanov. So it's a Russian um, work. And this one is, I think is 1908. Oh, yes, 1908. And uh, completely challenges uh, all this notion of, of uh, gender binaries. Um, I don't know if I can read from it. Can I read from it? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. yeah. 
I think there were some, one of the things I really loved about the book is that not only did you have these really incredible illustrations, but you really brought in a lot of the prose and the literature um, that was referenced. I thought that was really encompassing of the way that artists of all sorts, from playwrights to choreographers, to visual artists, uh, to sculptors, um, to, you know, everyone has, was participating in it. So it, it, it was something that, that um, touched every creative soul in a sense. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I was trying to, because at first I, I, I hoped to um, only have like visual art. And then I realized all the uh, A-bomb literature from Japan, uh, I, I had to talk about it. Uh, th th I could not uh, do otherwise. So then if I do it for Japan, I had to do it for <laughs> other places. And then it became the same for mangas. So it's kind of escalated, but uh, somehow it happened. Um, so um, this book is about how um, a Martian uh, comes to her in, in Russia, of course, and uh, take with uh, like a spaceship uh, powered by radium uh, comes to earth in russia and takes one uh her people a man uh, to the planet mars and uh he is just him explaining what he saw and the whole thing is about having a community of beings uh, uh, that would be caught not just Earth, but uh, with the Martian, martians so we could share equally um uh, resources and radium uh, to power uh, technology and spaceships together. And at some point throughout the book, he addresses all the scientists on the spaceship and all the people, all the Martian as men. And there is a very, so spoiler alert, I'm sorry. <laughs> and there is a turning point where he realizes that during all that time, he was attracted to one of them. It was a woman, a female uh, Martian. And here is how he talks about uh, the Martian community. The women have rel relatively broad shoulders, while the narrow pelvis of and a certain tendency to plumbness in the men make their muscles less prominent and tend to neutralize the physical differences between the sexes. This, however, is mainly true of the most recent epoch, the era of free human evolution for in the stages uh, dating from as late as the capitalist period, the distinctions are m much more obvious. It is evidently the enslavement of women at, in the home and the fervent struggle for survival on the part of the men, which ultimately account for the physical discrepancies uh, dis between them. So this is 1908. <laughs> Um, so that's very interesting. And another artwork, um, I'm sorry, sorry. Okay. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> another book I liked very, very much, um, uh, is by William S. Borrow. Um, and he's, he's known for Naked, naked Lunch. Uh, but uh, it's true that he wrote Naked Lunch at the time he was uh, of the Cold War and he was scared by it. And it's about drugs. But there is one other uh, short story. It's called Astronauts Return. Uh, and it's about, um, it's about uh, atomic things. And he talks about um, um, the fact that uh, white people uh, so he just it, it really kind of go beyond like the gender binary and just take humans as themselves, but it's white and 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 uh, non-white, so to speak. Uh, and he said that uh, the uh, whiteness of the skin comes from disease, and this disease was because of contamination by uh, nuclear exper experiments that went wrong, and that uh, these people went into caves, and then when they came out, uh, they they. Um, they just could not uh, stay with themselves. They had to bother everybody else. 
And I thought that was very nice to have this kind of uh, uh, targeting of uh, being a man and targeting all this kind of war and, and uh, race thinking and, and say this is bullshit, basically. Um, I don't know if, because we don't have much time. I could read from it, but it's, it's in the book as well. It's a very beautiful thing. Um, and then there's another one. Uh, so by a female, um, a female writer. So, uh, so Riyam Esboro is 1973. So I'm sorry, I'm kind of going a bit in time, but I, I, I was, I'm a gentle lady. I, I did men first. Um, now, uh, this is by a woman. Uh, so she's British uh, writer, Marie Corelli. And this, oh, sorry, I don't know. If, and this is called uh, The Secret Power, uh, 1921. Uh, so this is very early as well. So I think this is the time of the suffragette still, since the suffragette has been, uh, <laughs> have been uh, protesting for a very long time before getting the vote. And in this book, she uh, opposes two characters. Uh, there is a female scientist, so this is modeled after uh, Marie Curie, and um, a male scientist, uh, but modeled after no one because at the time there was no bomb, and he uh, designed a bomb as well. So there is this kind of two characters uh, there, and uh, the main point is uh, lack of love uh, will bring will will bring war basically because this male scientist is impossible to love. Uh, in, in the thing. Um, yeah, pretty much. Uh, there is also Ellen Clarkson's, an American writer, uh, The Last Day, a novel of the day after tomorrow is 1950s. Uh, it's very interesting as well. Very interesting. I don't know if I answered the questions. I think we're running a little bit out of time, so I don't want to talk too much. I'm very passionate about it, so you have to stop me. We still have about 15 minutes, but um, I, I do um, you know, want to also open it up to people on, on, in the chat to feel free to post your questions. Um, I'm going to ask a, a question that, I, that I'm quite interested in and that I think really um, warrants some important discussion, and that's around censorship. Um, censorship of art and information is a recurring topic in your book. Can you comment on the difficulties you've had accessing information on these subjects? Yeah, so it has been a surprise to see how strong the censorship is and so many different levels. Um, it does make sense somehow that with a device such as the atomic bomb, the military is uh, are going to uh, control the information. So um, uh, the censorship uh, after Hiroshima was very strong and I discussed this in the book as well. It's called the press code uh, and it was enforced by the General MacArthur and it lasted for uh, a little bit less than 10 years, which is long, it's very long. Uh, so what my surprise about this is um, the information definitely was contained. Uh, and I don't think uh, the West uh, knew exactly how hard it was. The only thing that uh, slipped through the, the net of censorship was uh, John Hersey. Uh, I'm sorry if I don't say his name right. Uh, John Hersey, uh, Hiroshima. Um, and um, my surprise was that even when the censorship was lifted, and although uh, a lot has been translated, uh, very few has been circulating uh, in the West. And that was my surprise. I think the censorship was very strong and very efficient in doing this. Um, I compared the whole thing uh, to uh, moth um, night butterflies. We've been watching, we've been attracted to the brightness of the uh, mushroom cloud, but uh, we didn't look at what was happening beneath it. Um, and it has been quite of a surprise for me. Uh, I would say for Chernobyl that uh, much to my surprise, uh, I found a lot of information, uh, precisely perhaps because people have been pointing at the, the, the uh, initial state censorship. 
Um, there's one book in particular, so from an Ukrainian politician called Ala, sorry, I have to read her name, uh, Yaroshinskaya. And the title is Chernobyl, a crime without punishment. And I found a lot of information about this, uh, uh, this censorship in uh, her book. And uh, clearly there was a target on arts as well, the arts as well. Um, but also through the words of the artist Igor Kostin, Sveltana Alexevich, uh, I could feel the censorship, but uh, uh, now a lot has been said. Uh, wh what was the hardest for me was uh, everything about the Marshall Islands and Mururoa, Mururoa, sorry, Mururoa. Uh, this is very safely kept secret, I think. Uh, the censorship is quite strong. At the moment, also I've been trying to find, but uh, I couldn't find exactly the details of, of the uh, impact on the Bikini Islanders who were kind of displaced, but still exposed. We know about the fishing crew of the Japanese fish, the Lucky Dragon, but we know a lot about this, but we don't know about uh, the uh, Marshallese Islander, and there's a lot about miscarriage, uh, which I, um, I, I've learned uh, through this uh, fantastic book, uh, poetry book, by uh, Kathy Jetnil Kishner, uh, Yep Jal Talk, uh, poet from, uh, Poems from a Marshallese Daughter, uh, which is a, a very strong uh, poetry, from 2017, so this is new. Um, and uh, uh, she talks about the miscarriages at the time, uh, but also the miscarriages now, and uh, what is called the jellyfish babies. Um, so they are born, sometimes still alive, but completely deformed. And um, um, they are still consequences today. She talks about her niece, Bianca, uh, who died of uh, leukemia. Uh, and she was, uh, I think, about 10 years old. So it's very young. Uh, and it's the same I found through the artworks uh, in, the, in uh, Polynesia. So Chantal Spitz, uh, Rai Chazé, uh, and Henri Hiro. But Henri Hiro was more like anti-colonial uh, and anti against nuclear. Um, bombs uh, in, in, in Polynesia. Um, and one of the strong censorship also, which is uh, very uh, insidious, is the one in Pozen Woman. Uh, for example, in Three Mile Island, um, the desire to talk about abortion uh, because they felt contaminated, should they abort or not, what kind of pressure, like they, they felt they could not uh, talk about it. So there is this kind of uh, also self-censorship by kind of yeah, talking about abortion is not an easy thing. And then there's the uranium mind. Um, the uranium mind is this huge invisible thing, uh, huge invisible thing. Um, and everything kind of spewed out uh, to me. As soon as I scratched the surface of it, just by one, the French uranium uh, mine in Niger, so a former colony, um, everything came out. All the Western um, or rich countries kind of use the colonial system even after uh, the, uh, because uh, Niger is not colony anymore. They used the, the kind of routing to uh, drag and take mine all the resources in extremely unfair prices it's very shocking and with a lot of contaminations as well um i had an image i wanted to share so uh this is from uh all right i'm sorry for the quality that's the only thing i could find uh this image is the pavilion uh, of uranium in uh, Niger uh, on the Bubuhama uh, National Museum uh, of, National, uh, of uh, Natural um, History Museum. And this pavilion is sponsored by Areva, 
uh, who is the French uh, nuclear uh, corporation that mines uranium in uh, in Niger, and they sponsor this uh, pavilion. I don't know if you realize, but uh, they talk about it as of um, the renovation of the museum is about uh, from dinosaur age to nuclear age. So they really implanted their own timeline into uh, a natural history museum, which is uh, kind of uh, uh, unbelievable. And um, uh, mining in unfair prices. I want to point out that Bubu Hama uh, was a writer. I talk about him in my book. He was a writer uh, from Niger and he participated to the ne negotiation of uranium prices in the 70s, uh, which were extremely low uh, compared to uh, the price in France, because France used to have uh, mines as well. Uh, and uh, by coincidence, maybe, uh, a milit military, coup, military coup swept away these um, uh, negotiations uh, and they changed the government. So this is uh, one thing. The uranium mine is the hardest for me. So there's a lot of mines on na native territories in, in the US, uh, in Canada, in Niger, um, Namibia, uh, by British and British Australian and French uh, corporations. Uh, I wish I had time to talk more about this. Uh, what is very interesting is that um, the information is public on the website only if you know where to look and uh, it's kind of uh, sanitized, of course, not to make it uh, look alarming. And uh, at the moment I was finishing the book, uh, Areva, so the French company, changed its name to Orano, a different name. And doing so, they kind of revamped the entire website and all the information I had uh, gathered for like 10 years uh, went, disappeared. Uh, so I think this type of censorship uh, is there. It's not exactly a censorship, it's just uh, not providing the information. Could, could you, um, uh, la later on, I think um, we'll have a lot of more time to actually carry this discussion on Facebook afterwards. So maybe what you could do is in, in on um, the, under the video, uh, chat links, share some of the links um, to some of these works that you have mentioned so that we can continue the dialogue. We are um, getting close to running out of time, but I want to make sure that anybody from the audience has the opportunity to ask anything or make a comment. From, from um, either Facebook or, or Zoom. Okay, while we're waiting for some of that to come in, um, uh, do you want to share anything else with us? Or um, go, oh, we have one. All right. It's, um, oh, she just gave the video link. But um, um, do you have anything else you want to share with us or kind of discuss? What, what are some other things that from, from this book that were really critical to, to some of your discoveries or some of the artworks that were, were um, something that would be important for us to see? Yeah, I'm gonna share the um, uh, Miss Q, uh, which is something uh, I discuss in the book, the Miss Atom Bomb, uh, which had a lot of uh, interest somehow. Uh, so this is from the um, Cold War time, and which again, we have this gender binary um, uh, really clearly here. Uh, men are war and, and she's just a beauty. Um, and how this has been uh, has evolved in another uh, very uh, surprising uh, corporate stunt, which is the, um, and, and not stand, sorry, uh, corporate um, advertisement strategy. Uh, this is the Miss Atom 
competition, beauty contest. So this is uh, one of them. I like her necklace in particular that looks very like um, um, the design of the at home. And um, it's very interesting because uh, there is this continuation of kind of heterosexual um, um, patriarchal understanding of the gender binaries. Uh, what is interesting about this uh, beauty contest is the, um, I'm going to stop sharing, uh, is the, um, this, it's con still continuing. So I understand the desire of the uh, Russian uh, nuclear industry to actually go beyond uh, Chernobyl. It happened a long time ago now, and uh, nothing else happened on, on site, or not that we know of. Um, so I understand the desire to kind of change the image uh, of the Russian uh, nuclear industry. However, uh, tapping onto women, uh, like uh, it's kind of, this kind of sexist uh, thing, um, it's, it's uh, surprising. I think I don't. I don't know. I don't think it's the best strategy, if you ask me. But uh, the idea would be to render it more glamorous, if you will. And this competition is open to all the women uh, working in in the nuclear industry. So it's very strange that this intellectual, like, uh, uh, woman would be asked to uh, compete for beauty, not for their uh, mind. Uh, and another thing I would like to share as well, um, another thing I would like to share, that's the cookbook. Uh, I wish I could have uh, talked about this fantastic cookbook by the Women's Strike for Peace. Uh, so the Women's Strike for Peace uh, in the uh, 60s, for 20 years, thousands and thousands and thousands of women have been marching in the United States uh, for a long time um, to protest against a uh, nuclear device and also nuclear uh, war at large. So it was also um, uh, against the Vietnam War. And here I, I chose this one. So it's a cookbook with recipes from all over the world. And this one is the Japanese too. And you can see at the bottom here, uh, two parts of uh, a Japanese a woman in, in kimonos uh, having a, um, a panel, a, a slogan to protest because it also comes from Tokyo it as wise who started petition against nuclear weapons in the 50s. Um, and so this is very interesting because if we talk about censorship, uh, I came across this by accident. It's never in history, a textbook on nuclear uh, things, uh, all these things by women. Uh, they were like about 50,000 women uh, at some point or two. This a lot of women uh, protesting and this is completely forgotten. Um, and a last one I'd like to share is from North Korea. And this is Paul Gassery. Um, and this is a film, a kind of uh, um, a monster film, uh, like Godzilla film, but done by the military, by uh, North Korea. I wish in my book, I had more time and space to actually talk about North Korea. I think I'm running out of time. I would like to tell you more about Pogasari because also the filmmaker was kidnapped by North Korea from South Korea and some of the props were from uh, Japan. And it's, uh, it's a funny, fascinating, fascinating film and story. But I think I'm running out of time, unfortunately. Okay, well now I'm curious. Um... We are we are running out of time, and I I do want to um, respect that, and I want to thank you for sharing this really, really, really intriguing and critical um, manuscript with us. Because now I think this is we're coming back to a lot of these these issues today. This is very yeah. topical. Uh, I think this is something that's as um, artists, it's a really important area to kind of explore. So thank you for providing this context. 
Um, I also want to encourage everyone to continue the discussion online and please go ahead and share it with uh, your, your communities. And next month uh, in August, we'll be doing another uh, book club live event. This time we'll be with the Leonardo Journal Seagraph issue. This will be led by Erica Ruby, our managing editor. She will uh, reach out to everyone or Nick will reach out to everyone on when the next date is for that. Uh, but right now I want to thank again uh, Gabriela and De Camos for Invisible Colors uh, published with MIT Press this year. Um, you're welcome to uh, take a look at it online. Uh, we have put some discount codes in the in the feed so we haven't already had the opportunity to read this. Um, I definitely encourage you to do so and we'll archive this video on Facebook and on YouTube. So thank you Gabriela and thank thanks everyone joining us. It's been a, a great pleasure. Thank you.